Good morning, STM. In the month of November, we remember. Our minds and hearts are filled with memories of those who have died and gone before us as we celebrate All Saints Days, All Souls Day, and Remembrance Day. Veterans and Canadian Forces members who have given their lives in the pursuit of peace have made great contributions to our country and the world. Remembering what all these men and women have done during times of war, military conflict, and peace help us to understand the country we live in today and how we can build a better future. STM, please stand for the last post and to observe the one minute of silence. In military tradition, the last post is the bugle call that signifies the end of the day's activities. It is also sounded at military funerals to indicate that the soldier has gone to his final rest and at commemorative services such as Remembrance Day. Please be seated. Let us begin with the sign of our faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we honor the memory and lives of our brothers and sisters who have died in the wars of our nations. We thank the men and women who served and who are currently serving in the military services today. We also remember those who are actively engaging in the preservation of peace. Lord, hold our troops in your loving hands. Protect them as they protect us. Bless them and their families for the selfless acts they perform for us in our time of need. Be with us as we reflect and pray this morning. May this gathering and prayers help move our world one step closer to the peace of your kingdom. Help us build a world that has no room for hatred, no place for violence, in a world which love and peace can live and strive. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. St. Thomas More, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. STM, at this time, let us reflect and watch. Alone, narrow 
little streets of cobblestone Neath the halo of a street lamp I turn my color to the cold and damp When my eyes were stemmed by the flash of a neon light That split Good morning, St. Thomas More, and thanks for this opportunity. It's difficult to understand why so many men rushed out of their homes and enlisted so quickly 106 years ago, at the beginning of World War I. Perhaps they were swept up by the romance of war, an idea that glorified their home and country. Nationalism, another dangerous idea, blinded these men into believing they were fighting for a cause. It takes huge public pressure and social pressure to make Canadian-born men enlist noted Canadian historian Jack Ranstein. They were swept up in the romance, just like the militaristic countries in Europe. So much so that the insignificant 3,000 man Canadian army of 1914 added 30,000 voluntary recruits within the first seven days. They bought into the romance of war. Nationalism is a dangerous idea. This is why Albert Einstein called it the measles of mankind. Blind obedience provoked an exodus of men from their homes and enthusiastically marched them to the battlefields of Europe. But something happened as the war dragged on for four long, grueling years. Things changed, and doubt crept in. The romance of war was challenged through experience, which could take a variety of forms. Take 23-year-old gunner Percy Sawyer, who was one of these young, young Canadians swept up in the pre-war enthusiasm. Like so many others, he was looking for an adventure, a paycheck, three meals a day, a fancy uniform, a chance to see Europe. He enlisted with all the others of Alciarte, Quebec, did his core training, and arrived at the Salisbury Plain in England in the autumn of 1914 for a soggy winter of work before being shipped out to Belgium or France. Less than a week after his arrival, Sawyer was mending a horse when it took off, kicking him and dragging him down a hill by a rope attached to his wrist. The coroner's report states that he breathed a little, 
but was obviously dying. Dr. John McRae examined the bruised, torn body of the now dead Percy Sawyer, known by few. Little weird, isn't it? To come all the way from Canada to England to be killed by a horse? Where was the romance of war for Percy Sawyer? He never saw a battlefield. He never fought for his country. But at 23 years old, he was dead, killed by a horse. Or how about the polite Padre poet, Canon Frederick Scott? He was one of 447 clergymen from Canada who served overseas as a member of the Canadian Chaplain Service. He always insisted on sharing the risks and hardships with the soldiers whom he called his boys. On October 21st, 1916, he was in the Valley of the Somme in a nearby village staying with a local priest. He was feeling joyous because his son, Henry Hutton Scott, was in a nearby trench participating in the, val the Battle of the Somme. That day, Henry Scott was in a shell hole looking at his watch when he was hit in the head with a bullet from a machine gun. The Padre poet was offering service when the news reached him. Was this his patriotic duty? That glorious romantic moment on the battlefield? He lost his son, and unlike so many other parents, he was only a few short kilometers away. But like so many, he was helpless. If the romance of war was still alive by 1916, it certainly died with the soldiers at Messine Ridge in Belgium in 1917. Here, British General Douglas Haig needed to take the high ground ridge before he could begin an offensive at Passchendaele. The British and Canadians had been tunneling underneath the 10 kilometer ridge for the past two years. They were planting explosives and the Germans knew they were doing this because they found one of the tunnels. Both sides were mining underground and they would sometimes meet there in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. The day before the offensive, General Herbert Plummer told his men, gentlemen, we may not make history tomorrow, but we shall certainly change the geography. The attack began by blowing up the 10 kilometer ridge line with over 1 million pounds of explosives buried underground. These explosives all detonated within 28 seconds of each other. The earth erupted into pillars of fire. The sound was so loud that British Prime Minister David Lloyd George recalled hearing it in London, England. In fact, there are some reports that indicate it was heard in Ireland. A professor of geology in Lyle fell out of bed thinking it was the biggest earth tremor to ever hit that part of France. German accounts actually suggest that they lost the war because a massive hole appeared in the middle of their lines. It's thought to be the largest man-made explosion in human history prior to nuclear weapons. The human casualties, however, were tremendous. 10,000 German soldiers were killed instantly. Some were found with a bottle of wine in their hands and no physical signs of injury. They were dead though, killed by the concussion. The Canadians who participated here did not even see their faces. These were men just like them. Back home they had a family, a job, a life of their own. What made them an enemy? They shared so many similar characteristics. In fact, they had much more in common than they would like to believe. Barry Bromley, a First World War historian and collector, standing outside the Pool of Peace, the site of the biggest explosion, but now a lovely pond with lily pads and a no fishing sign, noted, we were the winners, they were the baddies. They didn't hate the Belgians, they didn't wanna be here. They were all whipped up in propaganda and romance, same as the British. And the actual guy on the ground was just fighting for his life. Doubt had crept in. The romance of war was long gone. Everybody wanted to go home. They had witnessed firsthand the futility of war. They were now questioning their country, their tactics, their motivations, their alleged problems with the central powers. They were thinking critically now, and that's the point. 102 years since the end of World War I, how far have we come? In a world ripe with division, amongst a global, invisible enemy, in an era of fake news and media unreliability and extreme biases, are we thinking critically? One of the most important lessons to learn in the first half of the 20th century is the dangers of blind obedience. Don't think something because you are told to think it. Think about it by asking the right questions and exploring the motivations of who or what is telling you to think it. Perhaps this lesson is more important than ever. Over 60,000 Canadians died in the Great War. Let's remember them. And more importantly, let's remember the lessons we can learn from them. And now we will recite the John McRae called In Flanders Field. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row. 
that mark our place and in the sky, the lark still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with a foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith, us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. This concludes our Remembrance Day ceremony. Your attention, participation, and cooperation are sincerely appreciated. Thank you, STM.